So let me get right to today's speaker, which uh, uh, Dr. Eric Peden, who obviously really needs no introduction here, uh, but just for the folks uh, that are watching online, uh, Eric uh, did his uh, medical schooling at UT Southwestern, did his va re uh, general surgery uh, and vascular training at, at uh, University of Texas and at, uh, at Rush, and then he went back and did some additional endovascular fellowship training at Texas Tech. So Eric, uh, obviously, is the chief of uh, vascular surgery here, and he holds the uh, Rusty Walters uh, Endowed Chair in CV Surgery. So Eric is going to talk to us today about new solutions for dialysis access. So Eric, welcome. Great. Thanks so much. All right. It's a pleasure. Uh, frequently, I think a lot of the local guys go and speak regionally, nationally, et cetera, but rarely at home, right? So it's good to keep everybody abreast at home of what's going on. It's exciting times in dialysis access. It's, uh, that's not always been easy to say because dialysis has had not too much change for many decades. But in the last few years, there have been a lot of new things that are coming and going uh, and things that are coming up that we've been a part of here. Uh, when I first came through training, uh, kind of like Dippin said, I had to kind of bounce around. I was going to do general surgery, then general and vascular surgery. And then when I ultimately decided to do just straight vascular surgery, which seems strange to the trainees now, but you know, 20 years ago that wasn't the case. Most of us, most people did both at the time, or it was a side job of other people. There was one podiatrist and one nephrologist alone that got me busy and kept me busy um, in vascular surgery. And somehow dialysis access just became me, uh, despite not having done any of it in my training. So I'm gonna talk about some of the newer things that we've been involved in. I have lots of disclosures, always looking for more. Alan Lums and my boss. Uh, <laughs> He's had a really strong belief in relation, strong relationships with industry being very beneficial to us, to industry, to patients, et cetera. Uh, just important that you talk about it. Um, I have been in research projects with many of these people. I serve as a um, consultant to one of the products that we'll talk about with the percutaneous fistula device that's uh, made by uh, Billy Cohen. Um, and we run training courses here. So I'm gonna talk about a new uh, device for centrovenous occlusion, which is a real problem in dialysis patients. And it's been one of my real interests in dialysis access because for a while it was awesome surgery that we used to get to do. Um, and now it's turned into less invasive things. Percutaneous fistula creation, which is a pretty hot topic right now in dialysis. Um, and then new graft that's come out that's uh, tissue engineered, which is hoping to get soon to approval. Um, Drug eluding technology is also just starting to hit dialysis. Unfortunately, it's hit right at the time when drug eluding technology and peripheral arterial disease has come under quite the cloud in terms of increased mortality. So it's not clear what that's going to do. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is what's called the surfacer device. And this is actually invented by this guy. It's John Gurley. He's a cardiologist from Kentucky. And he kind of got inspired by the old uh, defunct now Sigourney Weaver movie, The Alien, where this thing popped out of the belly and kind of went around and crunched up everybody, and he's like, why am I fighting my way through the occlusions from the outside? I'm going to come from the inside where things aren't blocked and pop out, because the pressure is actually higher in the obstructed peripheral veins than it is in the central veins, right? And that's the reason the circulation is going the way that it is. So he was having this problem with people that needed pacemakers, and once he started doing this and perfecting this technique, um, he had all kinds of people coming to him that needed TPN lines for chronic uh, you know, short gut, and then dialysis access somehow found his way, and a few years ago, um, kind of latched onto him at a conference, and, the, and then he's produced a product which has gone on to almost to market now. So it's been around for quite some time. He founded this company to help de develop this device because in his own hands, he was taking wires and sharpening on the back table in the cath lab with a hone that you'd use to sharpen your knife and then ramming those through the skin. Hard to get that through the Methodist IRB or uh, our products committee, I think, to get the, you know, hunting hone back there. Um, it got CE mark relatively quickly, and they've completed a trial in the, uh, in Europe, and now it's completed a trial here in the US, actually. So he first, he changed the name from the alien, because it was a little gross for most people, and plus generationally, just nobody understood that anymore, to now this inside-out technique. And again, first report in the cardiology literature. So again, he was using off-the-shelf products with transeptal needle and sharpened wire, and just his own little ingenuity to make this happen. And then they reported on several patients that had had this done. Since that time, he's gone on to do over 300 patients. It's just absolutely crazy, and he does this in just minutes. The SAVE trial, where it was initially tried, uh, was throughout Europe, 30 patients, and with primary safety, and dialysis and non-dialysis patients, and proved to be safe in, in those hands without mortality. And they look at the SVC occlusions, and this is really made for patients with central venous occlusion, right? So it could be something relatively mild, where it's just an internal jugular occlusion, or something that's uh, SVC occlusion all the way down below the SVC. And most of these, it turns out, 
or patients that have a brachiocephalic vein occlusion or a jugular occlusion. And John had this kind of unique position on this saying, you know, just because my right side's occluded doesn't mean you go to my left side and occlude that, and then go to my subclavian and occlude that, and then my other subclavian and occlude that, and then occlude my femorals until I'm stuck with transhepatic access. So John said, you can take one of my central venous accesses, and that's it. And after that, I want a device that lets me go back to the right side of the neck every time. And that's what he created. And it's, it's kind of a unique thing because we wind up obliterating much of the central venous circulation in these dialysis patients. One question is, is that where this is going to play a role? Um, so in the U.S. then, uh, we started a, a subsequent trial, which has also gone through, uh, which is a non-randomized prospective performance study, really, again, looking at safety. And the question was, could we cross these lesions, and could we do that without major mortality or morbidity? And the, the, a total of 30 patients were done here in the U.S. We were one of the seven sites that that happened, or six sites, I guess it was. Uh, it turns out that we were the lead and roller. With, uh, we maxed out at 10. They wouldn't put us, let us put any more into the study than that. And I'll show you how the procedure goes, and it's going to show the floral images along with um, sort of the company uh, pictorial on this. So you come from below, and he's done this through the liver and other things, but in this, in this case, the SVC or brachycephalic veins are occluded, and you see that up there. We're coming from below through the heart into the SVC stump. You can see the azagus still, still lights up, so this is occlusion just above the azagus. Um, and you can see collateral veins coming in from below. So you get what we would call a sheath, and this is actually our first case. In their, in their case, they call it a workstation. You get this large sheath up there and make sure it's embedded in there. And you have to give up wire access at this point, which is a little disconcerting to most of us. And then you advance this device, which is a straight metal rod with a kind of a blunted tip. And you can see that it tells the sheath where to go, right? Because it's a fairly stiff device. And you advance it out of that up through the soft tissues in the mediastinum and then get above the clavicle and then poke out. You put a little skin marker up on top so that you can aim this device. It's got that little window, and it's got a needle gauge or a needle guide that comes out just below that window, and that window's there really to help you see. That needle gauge advances out, and then they've got what they call the needle wire. So again, that's a really sharpened wire that comes out and pokes right through the skin. And he shows doing this on patients wide awake in his cath lab. They're singing opera stories and all kinds of stuff at the time. Again, he's really quite the character. So then you don't push devices in from there. You actually pull them in from there because you've created this false path basically from the outside into the residual stump of SVC or right atrium. And you do a pullback injection, and you can see some extravasation there. But what we're looking for is filling of a cavity, right, and making sure the pericardial space is not filling with fluid or the, uh, the pleural space is not filling with fluid. And if they're not, then you just created a track. Right? And as long as you kind of maintain that track, then generally things are safe. And again, the pressure lower on the inside. So as long as you don't hit a major vessel or expose yourself into a cavity, then we know that most times venous bleeding will take care of itself. And after that, it winds up essentially being a catheter. In the dialysis population, that means that that gets converted into a herograft ultimately. And again, you've not really reopened the vein. You've just created a new path into the veins. So, so that's pretty exciting uh, because for most of these patients, then they were relegated to going down to leg access or being stuck with catheters only down the legs, et cetera. And this is for patients with uncrossable venous lesions. And one of the interests is if the right side's occluded, should you put the catheter on the left or should you use this device to go through on the right side and not injure the left side? And we know that left-sided catheters in dialysis patients, remember these are big catheters. These are 15 French that stay there a long time. And patients that already have coagulopathy and disorders and then go on to occlude their left side. Now they've got both sides occluded, which is a real problem. So his point in this is that really these patients should be treated again to go to this right side. So they finished the 30 cases. Only one was aborted, uh, actually by us, because we couldn't direct the catheter in the right direction. I'll show you about that. And then ultimately, uh, most patients go on and get a HERO device. Um, so the re early results, like I said, has been very promising. The US trial is now complete. Uh, it's certainly quicker, but nowhere near as fun as open surgery, right? Because when I came here and Mike Reardon and I did this and opened the chest and put the veins together and reconstruct the SVC directly, it was absolutely awesome. Uh, we still get to do that some, but just not nearly with the same frequency that we did before we had these uh, new percutaneous devices. So I would say, though, is anything ever as easy as it appears, right? Somebody comes, shows you this slick device, and you're like, wow, that's great, I'm going to try that. There's lots of behind-the-scenes manipulation with the commercially uh, well, approaching commercially available device. And this is still, again, not FDA approved yet. Uh, we've done preclinical testing in MITEI. It's image intensive heavy for sure. And Ponraj has been instrumental in making these cases happen. The senior engineer that's resident here that works with us in the hybrid suites and, ex and 
externally. So as you know, we can do 3D um, imaging in the, in the hybrid suites with rotational uh, imaging so we can get CT scans and such, and that can show us where the path is both before and after we pass these devices, right? And, not, and outside of trial, there have been reports of patients having major vascular injuries and including death. So I think to approach this without good imaging would really be perilous. Um, as we've gone and looked at it, here is one of the patients that we've done, and we can see the bright white that you see on the center of the screen and kind of where he's focusing. And this, again, looking at these reconstructions and multiple images, and we can see it traversing just in front of the anominate artery. And of course, that's where the veins are, right? They're right beside the vascular, stru their arterial structures. And then coming just up above the clavicle, and there's the head of the clavicle. And on the bottom left, then you see the wire kind of going right out of the skin uh, as it's gone there and straight through the target. Although, to be honest, I think we took the target on it after it came out of the skin. Uh, but confirmation of that, really important, obviously, right? Um, and then, of course, with these 3D reconstructions, you can do all kinds of cool manipulations, right? And look at these and rotate them around, look at them inside out, almost exactly like you described the procedure um, initially, right? And that, that leads to lots of wow factor stuff. So our first case, actually, is what we're just showing you. And I'll just tell you, it was not quite as simple as it appears. And after we had passed the device, and this is a great learning case, what we saw in this case, and if you'll focus on the bottom left where he's just put the crosshairs, the bottom left is tracking where that catheter is going up through the mediastinum. And we can see it in this case, it actually went behind the anominate artery. And the tip of this thing wound up right beside the trachea. So at the end of this, we did a bronchoscopy to make sure the trachea was okay, et cetera, and absolutely no problems. We went on, converted this to a catheter and later to a hierograph that we used for quite some time. Um, but nonetheless, you know, really close to some major structures. So we went to the cadaver lab. We actually did that first. I'm just showing it to you backwards. Uh, and here's the device itself. And that's the needle gauge or the needle guide that's coming out with a little curve on it. And then that needle wire, which again is really sharp, that's coming straight out the end. Before those are exposed, it's just that straight um, you know, metal device that you're putting up. So Jean Bismuth has created a central venous occlusion model. Went to Home Depot and got this stuff that's used for your foam insulation. I can really attest to the strength of this stuff now. It's really tough to cross occlusions when you make them with this. And he'd filled up the central veins for one of the courses that we had. And we used the idea that he had come up with to make that. So in the cadaver lab, then we went and did that um, to see if we could recreate this occlusion and then try and cross that. The problem is if you've ever used that stuff at home, it's really messy and it goes everywhere. Even if you put balloons up in front and behind it, that stuff just simply goes. And in fact, we could see our first paths, although we thought we were okay, when we did our rotational imaging, had gone right through the lung and right out through the chest. Misfire on that one. Fortunately, that was in the cadaver before we got started clinically. So then coming back, we're able to go back and redirect ourselves. Uh, and this time, Panraj put little target circles on there for us. And we're able to divide or direct up through there and then drive right up past the clavicle. The anatomy is a little distorted because of the cadaver, um, but right up through there and then successfully complete. Afterwards, it was great. We did an illustrative uh, cadaveric dissection. Um, and you can see here we've gone and we've taken off the anterior chest wall. Uh, we've exposed the heart mediastinum. We're pulling that wire out. And again, that wire is really wickedly sharp. So you want to protect that with a hemostat so you don't injure yourself. Have it poke in the patient's eye or something else. So in this case, it wasn't such a big deal. And then we opened the SVC down into the right atrium to see what the path of this device was like. And sure enough, it had gone in right beside the occlusion and then poked out, as you'd seen, through the upper SVC. And then we'd driven that up behind the clavicle and poked out through the skin. As we went down, we could see that our foam had gone a little further than we'd kind of initially planned. And that was, was so challenging to direct ourselves up initially. Because we went down, it completely filled the heart, gone down to the IVC, filled the renal veins, et cetera. But there you can see it had gone right up through there in a relatively straight path and come up and penetrate exactly like we said. And this stuff, like I said, really sticks the good stuff. So it's really exciting technology for really challenged dialysis patients. I'm not sure that it's gonna be really widely applicable to every single patient. I, my own personal bias is it is image intensive. Um, in our case, we've always had cardiac surgery on standby at the time. That obviously makes that a mess, but cardiology has gone through similar. Uh, struggles with other things. I think it needs a Gen 2 of the device. It's steerable, um, but it's going to require, it's going to allow centrovenous access in patients who otherwise couldn't have it. It is pretty easy to perform, but the potential hazards are very real and I think uh, needs careful attention. So I'm going to shift now and talk about percutaneous fistula creation. And fistulas and dialysis access have been around for quite some time. If we go back, the radiocephalic fistula or semino fistula was first described back in 1966. Uh, we went 10 years before we had any other real advances. In 76, then we had the PTFE graft uh, that became available. 
And since that time, other fistula options and uh, anatomic variations have been described with brachycephalic, basilics, transpositions going to the legs, other types of grafts. Um, but sadly, not a lot has really changed stuff. And the gold standard remains the 60 plus year old radiocephalic fistula, the original fistula, right? It remains relatively low flow. It rarely causes steel compared to some of the accesses. It has lots of venous outflow options for the cephalic, basilic, and deep system, which are the reasons that it can stay patent. But as Dr. Lemsen likes to say, you just can't sell fempops, right? So what's the next mousetrap? Um, so why change? Been working for 50 years, but in fact, if you look at the recent studies that have been done, and big, big trials have been done with hundreds of patients, this one nearly 1,000 patients, dialysis patients now are different than they were back in the 60s, right? When it was initially for Vietnam vets that were coming back and weren't going to go to work or trying to go to work, but were young, healthy people and had injuries and other things, it's different than the 90-plus-year-old people that have been having a long, long hard time, that are double amputees, you know, on an LVAD and all these other things that we get asked to place access in, which sometimes blow your mind. But the current maturation rate, as defined in this one trial, was only 40%. So less than a coin toss of getting a successful functioning fistula if you did that in a patient. Thank God we weren't part of that trial because I just don't know I could say that out loud to patients. So hopefully none are watching. But if they are, I think we'd do better. Um, so state of the art then, this also came through and they did the failure to mature, mature uh, trial, uh, also in several hundred patients. Again, less than 50% unassisted maturation, it's a real issue. We do know that with endovascular techniques, we're able to mature many fistulas that in those days were not maturing well. So the last year has seen the approval of two new percutaneous fistula creation systems. One's the Avenue Ellipsis device, which is ultrasound guided only, and the other is uh, BD Wavelength. And BD Wavelength has a very uh, local following here. That's the one that Billy Cohn invented 20 plus years ago, uh, then formed a company which got bought up by Bard and then BD. We actually did the first uh, commercial case here in the US here. Uh, and then we run on one of the training centers for this device. Um, I've used both devices. Um, but I have been a consultant and we do train for BD. Um, so percutaneous fistula anatomy really relies on the perforator vein. And most surgeons, unless they were a fan of one particular type of fistula, ignored the perforator vein their entire careers. But the perforator vein, we think most perforator veins are for draining the superficial veins down to the deep system and then carrying things away. We know that the valves in the upper extremity are much less competent than the valves in the lower extremity. So in the legs, this probably wouldn't work because most, most perforator veins there, unless they're really pathologic, are competent and won't allow reflux from the deep to superficial. But in the arm, this vein almost seems like it's designed to go from the deep system up into the superficial. And in many cases, the superficial veins are actually bigger than the deep veins. So it really relies on that perforator vein. It relies on the fact that we have deep veins near our deep arteries, and those are connected with these small bridging veins, which previously were just annoying things we had to clip and tie and bled during surgery if we had to go down that far. And that there's communication back and forth, and as we go up the forearm from the wrist to the antecubital area, there's a confluence of the radial vessels, interosseous vessels, and ulnar vessels, and then they culminate sort of in this perforator vein, and the ones that don't go there go to the upper arm brachial veins. And then from the perforator vein, it in most cases goes up to a dual outflow of both cephalic and basilic systems. So when people said they're going to make the fistulas percutaneously, and most of us who are surgeons said, no way, nothing's going to happen, sure enough, here we are. So it's a connection somehow from the perforator vein directly to the deep veins and the artery, or from the deep veins themselves, and then directing flow up through there. And I'll show you how the two devices work. So the ellipsis device, again, the one that's ultrasound only, is one where you gain access most commonly to the cephalic vein, just above the elbow or just at the elbow, and then drive that through the perforator vein, right down through, ultrasound only, kind of circling in as you're going and keeping the needle in the bullseye, and then until you get down to the radial artery. So the perforator vein almost always sits right beside or sort of comes from the confluence of those vessels that come together right by the proximal radial artery. And surgically, people make a fistula here. It's called a Gratz fistula, but it's a fairly uncommon fistula, honestly, because there's so many little branches and stuff, it's a pain to go and tie all this off and make the fistula. So most people, you know, don't do that and just go up a little higher and make a brachycephalic fistula. So anyway, so you do that, you pop through, and you drive a wire down, and then there's this device that actually goes and closes that. And I'm showing you the animation here. So again, ultrasound got it access, down through the perforator vein, seeing the radial artery, changing from longitudinal to transverse view, puncturing into the radial artery and passing a wire. After that, then a six French sheath gets passed over the wire. This is a low profile system with an 018 wire. 
um, and then it's changed to an 014. So the sheath goes down through the vein into the artery, and there's typically not much bleeding at this point because you just had a 21 gauge needle puncture only, and now you're through with the sheath. You exchange your wire for the smaller one, and this is the device, and it's got that little space in between, and those two slanted areas are gonna come together and sort of weld a connection between these two vessels. So you need a really straight perforator vein is kind of one of the limitations of this, because this device, kind of like the other, is not gonna make a lot of turns. That device gets placed inside of it, you position it across the wall, again, all ultrasound guided, none of this with fluoroscopy, so it means your ultrasound skills really have to be up to snuff. You close this thing down, you put it through two cycles, and it's again, it's basically bovine a connection between the two. And this one actually makes a fairly solid connection that does not easily pull apart. After that then, the routine now is to come and balloon that area immediately to open that up further with a five millimeter balloon, and you're left with a fistula. Pretty slick. So that's the ellipsis device, and then afterwards the patients uh, go home looking like this, right? I mean, perhaps not with the big veins, but with no scars on their arm uh, and just a puncture mark. And then for many of them, they've been described as being able to go on to access in a relatively short array of time. So they have to have really good anatomy. So the wavelength device that Billy Cohen's invented, here's his, and you get arterial access, and this is a fluoro-guided one. Uh, for most times, it's done in an ulnar-to-ulnar -ulnar fashion, because this one only cuts a hole, it doesn't actually weld a hole between the two. So we put a wire down through the ulnar artery to kind of mark where that trajectory is, do venography to see where the bigger of the two parallel veins are, although again, your preoperative planning is done mostly with ultrasound. We'll go down then and do some puffs, and we want to see that perforator vein that you saw that was going right up into the superficial system, and then we have to wire against the valves. This is now actually approved from venous to come from the wrist, but arterial so far is only approved to come from above, and you can see that sort of tortuous perforator vein going directly up to that large upper arm cephalic vein. So a really great candidate for this type of procedure. So battling the valves, then the arterial device goes in, and the arterial device has a backstop because the active cutting component is on the venous side. So if you have a misfire and it cuts out, it cuts, into the vein, it cuts out of the vein, not out of the artery. Um, so we want to get positioned there, just below that perforator vein if we can. It's really important for this device that you choose patients with good sized deep vessels. Um, because if it's a really small vessel, that vessel has a hard time dilating and growing because it's stuck in the kind of deep system and compartments. Um, so this is the earlier generation of the device, which was a six French, there's now a four French, or it's more like a four or five French. Um, and it comes in, it's got that little electrode hockey stick foot plate. Um, that gets exposed after you're properly aligned. And you kind of want a little Lincoln log look to the other side where it's covered and narrowed out for the backstop. And that electrode then gets exposed we want to see a nice tissue gap there that shows that we're aligned. It's some magnets, all the dark blocks are magnets in between the two. And we want to see that, that it goes through and touches. This is right by the median nerve, so it's very common that there's stimulation of the median nerve during this. Again, it's for brief, it's for 0.7 seconds. Uh, and that's what you're left with. And the challenge there is that the, the fistograms can look bewildering. Because this is done from the deep system, and this one it's mandatory to go and occlude one of the, one of the deep veins at the time, because you really want to divert the flow up into the superficial system. Now this is in an area where most times the vein does not get used, so I think for most people then that's not a real problem, but if you were planning on a brachial fistula or something else, then that's not the procedure that you'd want this person to have. But then afterwards, pretty robust flow superficially, and you can tell in this case, a really nice person with a uh, good candidacy for that. So, there's limited data that's been published, and almost all data has been outside of US. And that makes it really challenging, right? Because dialysis outside the United States is not the same as dialysis inside the United States, right? Our patients are older, they are more obese, and our dialysis units run by for-profit centers are not the same as government-run dialysis in other places, right? So if you're in the UK or Canada, or even down South America where I first uh, got to experience this device, you have a nurse that's doing your punctures with ultrasound guidance for your first few times. And then after you've graduated through that, then you're going to the centers. But again, most times it's nursing that's doing that. We have some really fantastic techs here, but there's almost no dialysis units in this country that have ultrasound there. The margin on these patients is so small, they just simply can't afford it. So in the NEAT trial, the really high success rates, the initial results were almost unbelievable because the results were so good. Um, and then subsequent results have come back to about 70% uh, patency of these fistulas across the two devices. In this case, they went back and did a cost comparison using retrospective data from USRDS, which is a big database system collected by CMS, which showed there's actually a cost savings because of reduced re-intervention in these patients for maturation procedures. The procedures evolved considerably over time. 
the coiling and embolization of the deep system was not initially appreciated to be important, but it turns out if you're making that fistula to the deep veins, you have to divert that flow up with the uh, wavelength system. With the ellipsis, it tends to be not so important. The radial veins don't as commonly devein into the deep system as the uh, ulnar veins do. So ellipsis has also published uh, different results. Again, most of these outside of US. The biggest user of these is in Paris and as a prolific uh, surgeon who's done many of these. The challenge is that most of these are not um, really reporting secondary procedures and additional maturation procedures clearly are being required and sadly most publications are not showing that. Both devices are under uh, direction from the FDA because of their early approval to do post-market approval studies and collect data on what exactly those things are and that trial is just about to get going for the wavelength and I'm not sure about the ellipsis. So it turns out that more than a thousand people have had each of these. These numbers have grown considerably since this. Uh, so more than a thousand have had each of the types of different uh, percutaneous fistula trials, uh, devices done to them. And I can tell you, if I'm running one of the training centers here, it is not the same mix of people that used to come to the dialysis sessions. It is now radiologists, nephrologists that are getting interested in this and doing these in outpatient labs and centers, sometimes not in the hospital, although reimbursement is still a challenge. Now, because this is a dual outflow fistula in many people, it's not the same traditional one vessel that's big and juicy and has all the flow going through it, and is a challenge sometimes for dialysis centers to use. And it requires a lot of communication uh, from the providers to the dialysis centers to make sure that they know exactly where this thing is. Again, that's, that's more challenged by the fact that, um, that they don't use ultrasound. Additionally, in Canada and other places, they will do two punctures below the elbow at the median cubital and median cephalic veins. In the US, it's almost unheard of to puncture anywhere near the elbow for fear that the patients are going to move their arm, needles come out at the time, which is a challenge. So percutaneous fistula challenges, uh, each one requires specific training. The, the systems are relatively expensive. You're looking at a lot of disposables for each case. The anatomy is clearly a little bit different. The ultrasound mapping is crucial in this case. And there's still some people uh, that do their dialysis surgeries without mapping, which I think is almost crazy. Um, but the anatomy and the mapping is really crucial that you do that well. Maturation is distinctly different uh, because of the issues that people can have, especially with the one that goes to the deep system primarily in terms of flow diversion to get those to the upside. And if somebody has an ulnar-based uh, fistula, doing surgical deconstruction of that is quite challenging surgery, I can tell you. So are there lessons from coronary disease? Absolutely, right? If you look at number of coronary interventions versus coronary bypass, it's considerably different, despite perhaps data that doesn't say that it should all be stents instead of bypasses. So percutaneous fistula is the thing that I tell my surgical colleagues, it's clearly changing the way somebody's doing dialysis access. Now, if you're not engaged in this, it can be somebody else doing it. My fear for that is that it leaves behind radiocephalic fistulas. And of all the complex stuff we do, and the herographs, and centromenous occlusions, et cetera, the most common access that I do for patients is radiocephalic fistulas. I many times find that's been left behind. If our patients here are a little heavy, that vein's been hidden by a little fatty tissue, and with ultrasound mapping and regional anesthesia and dilation, the radiocephalic fistula is still primary. If you get one of these percutaneous fistulas first, I'm concerned that that may decrease your radiocephalic util utilization in general, for sure it will, and then whether or not you'll be able to do that as a secondary procedure. So I think both companies have said primarily if you can get a radius valic fistula, that should still be your fistula of choice, and this would be a backup for you or a secondary uh, intervention. Um, and that's kind of a challenge, especially when you're doing patients uh, here that have had multiple accesses, et cetera. So tissue engineer grafts. This has been a thing for a long time of wondering when can we just get somebody to build us a kidney that we can just pop in or build us a, a vein that we can just pop in because we know that our patients many times don't have good veins, right? The number of dialysis or number of patients that we see in our clinic that are not yet on dialysis, that don't already have a catheter, that haven't been stuck and in the hospital or haven't been on the heart transplant team or something else is really small. It's less than 10%. In other areas of the country, they're doing 50% pre-access, pre-dialysis access creations, just not our practice. Part of it may be the wait time or who knows. Um, but it's kind of this thing that's always been the promise of the future is can we build a graph that actually behaves like fistulas? And you say, well, you know, why, right? Can you replace their own vessel or create a new one? Uh, could it be good for patients that have other things? Uh, is it good for trauma, right? It seems to have decreased infection potentially, good for other things like that. Coronary grafts if people are missing their other stuff. So you definitely have currently available alternatives with fistulas and commercially available grafts. PD, problem with PD, it's single digits, right? The number of people on peritoneal dialysis in this country is really trivial compared to other places in the world. PD is not a big thing for Americans. We're more of a drive-through society, sadly. 
Um, transplant sounds great, right? But we have over half a million people on dialysis and only 30,000 transplants happening, right? The wait time in the Houston area right now, some nephrologists in the community that are in this audience that may contradict me, but what I'm told is about six years now. That's a long time to wait on dialysis. And if your accesses are running out every two years or sadly shorter, that's a real problem. So why look for something new? Because we know grafts can be a challenge, right? And we can place grafts in many areas after patients have exhausted their veins. But we know this is the big problem, right, is the grafts are, are not natural, uh, they don't get endothelialized, and they lead to this stenosis, which is perhaps biological and mechanical. So there's been a, a, a series of uh, procedures that have been interested in this, and now there's one that's getting closer. It's not yet FDA approved. Uh, it's called a humocyte graft, and it's made from tissue engineering. They essentially take organ donors at the time. They take the aortic cells. They get vascular smooth muscle cells out. They create a basically vicral tube. They put that in a flown chamber, seed it with the cells, grow that for a period of several weeks. It becomes an actual vessel, digests out the PLGA. It comes over with tissue. They decellularize it chemically, and they're able to implant it. Um, there have been a few trials that have happened already. Uh, some in the U.S. that have been completed as a feasibility trial, and there are ongoing trials using it compared to grafts, compared to fistulas, vascular uh, bypass conduits, and for trauma. Turns out the de Defense Department is quite interested in having available off-the-shelf vessels that they can use that are less susceptible to infection. Um, so those things are all happening now. Um, the early results uh, show that it does seem to have a decreased chance of infection, but sadly, the patencies seem to be similar to the graphs that we've experienced. And the big trials have been done. I showed the abysmal results from fistula trials. The current graft data would say that only 25% or so of grafts at the end of one year remain patent without intervention. One in four. Terrible. Terrible. It's hard to have anybody else in this outcome, in this hospital with worse outcomes than we have, for sure. Right? Um, but that's a real challenge. And, and the early results say that the secondary patency is good, and that's shifted to be more of the focus. Um, we'd say so far it seems to be safe. It seems to be well tolerated. Really importantly, it does not seem to have immunogenic potential. So very carefully, they've followed uh, levels in these patients to make sure they weren't going to go on and develop problems that would prevent them from getting transplant, because we'd all agree that that's really the, the best thing for them. Uh, and that seems to be not the case. Interestingly, it seems to withstand aneurysms and other problems like that, and does seem to re, uh, re-endothelialize with your own native cells, but it still gets problems with stenosis. So just having the tissue graft alone looks like it's not enough. There probably needs to be a biological addition to that, but this graft is made for that. So again, ongoing trials comparing humocyte to standard grafts and fistulas. Only time and uh, the results will tell us what the real scoop is. And with that, I'll stop and happy to answer any questions. Eric, that was, that was phenomenal. It's a great uh, overview and a great intro for some. Uh, we've got time for questions. Uh, please use a microphone if you have a question. We've got one right over here. Uh, great uh, talk, uh, Eric, and a uh, nice review of what's, uh, what's new and cutting edge. Um, on the percutaneous creation of fistula, certainly that's a great step in the, in the right direction. In the right hands, that will be very good. You already alluded to the fact that some people or at some point may start doing it before thinking of a radiocephalic fistula, which is always a nice fistula to do, as you uh, clearly, you know, stated. You know, the other concern is, you know, having many branches and multiple outflow tracks that need to be coiled. This kind of increases the cost of the procedure. You already alluded to the fact that that's not being captured very well uh, secondary procedures later. Uh, also, the coils have to be MRI compatible, and you know MRI is an evolving you know field, and what's MRI compatible today may not be MRI compatible later. But the other issue: these branches that go to the deep system, when we occlude them so that we divert the flow into the into the upper cephalic, uh, you know we are occluding um, the the inflow to these deep veins, which could in the future be used for a transposed fistula, which is also of a concern, and. Um, you know, the outcomes are like 67% being able to be used. But of course, this is in the best hands. In the best hands, people are careful. These are trials. This is not like abuse and anybody doing it. So I think there's going to be some advancement, but there's going to be also some concern for abuse or, uh, you know, what happens afterwards. 
secondary procedures or problems with the deep venous system which could be used for the future. So these are the concerns. Yeah, I, I'll dip and I'll respond to the MRI question, but yeah, it's 7T on the shelf now, who knows, right? Is it just a trace of metal will make your body heat up or something? Um, you know, it's definitely a concern to me about radiocephalic fistulas, right? I mean, despite the fact that it being the most ancient access there is, it still should be the preferred access. Uh, and that, that's probably the biggest concern to me. The branches that you embolize in the deep system are not ones that are going to be commonly used for access, right? I mean, the number of people, and I survey them as they come to the courses, the number of people that do brachial vein transpositions is incredibly small. I don't know how many. So George Nassar is one of the interventional nephrologists here. He's big in the interventional community and nephrology community in general. And it's great to have you here, George. He's uh, published on you know, many things in, in access um, and spends a lot of time trying to mature and salvage these, these fistulas. And I don't know if you've come across any of these fistulas yet, George, but it's a real challenge to mature some of them. The ellipsis tends to be an historic forward because it's kind of a direct shot from vein down to artery. It's a little more traditional in how we think of access, but the wavelength definitely is not. Um, so to mature those is a challenge because you need to come transarterial and transvenous at the same time. But at the same time, maybe a little more applicable because you're not saddled with the tortuosity issues through the perforator. I think that the best results come in patients that are not yet on dialysis. Patients that are pre-dialysis and have not had a lot of vein abuse, have good median, median cephalic and median cubital veins, those are the ones that are really the best candidates. But I think many times you're probably right, as many times they could have a radiocephalic fistula. So I think that would be the choice for them. And the secondary procedures can be a challenge. MRI, I don't know how much of an issue is that with current coils. Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on each individual uh, device. And I think, you know, the point that you made is as you go to higher field strengths, you have to be more concerned. So for each individual device, you have to look at, is it labeled as conditional for one and a half at 3T and then 7T? I don't think anything's been tested <laughs> at 7T yet. So. Right. And I mean, along that line, I mean, you know, obviously, you, I think you, you touched on the fact that imaging is, is kind of a key role or plays a key part in, in what you do. You know, I always like to find out as an imager myself, what are areas, though, that you, you know, so it seems like imaging has obviously come along and it's providing you guys with a lot of useful information. What are things that you feel there's still unmet needs in from an imaging standpoint? Yeah, from the imaging, I think that both of the devices and dialysis patients in general really suffer from vascular calcification. Ruth Wentz is here with us in the audience. She and Joy Booking and their partner, Steve Fadum, has been talking about vascular calcification since before I even cared what vascular calcification was. But the more dialysis patients I've taken care of and the more just disproportionate amount of terrible vascular calcification they get is a real challenge for us. And it's a problem surgically. It's also a problem with these endovascular procedures. And we don't always know how bad it's going to be until we're there trying to put a clamp on or stick a needle through it because sometimes the imaging has just let us down. And we don't do CT imaging on most of these patients, right? They're ultrasound or MRs right. or other things. Yeah, I almost wonder if you, you could do essentially a, a CT calcium score of the, yeah, the, arm. the, the vessels, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Great, a any, any other uh, <laughs> questions for uh, Dr. Peden? Great, all right, well, oh, Dr. One, Dr. yep, Dr. Zogby. Eric, thank you very much, really a very nice, you know, um, field and I think it's evolving, still challenging though, right? So f for us who are not directly in the field, the radiocephalic looks like is currently the, the venous, uh, the shunt uh, that is preferred. Is that correct? That is. And what's the success rate and longevity of such? So, so that's, that's what's interesting, right? Is when you look at, you know, how well do these fistulas do and all these fistulas get lumped together. You know, it turns out the average lifespan for most access is about two to two and a half years. But that's combined with patients that lasted for 20 minutes and patients that lasted for 20 years. And there's such a disparity, so the distribution's pretty wide. So if a radiocephalic can get over the hump of working, can get the angioplasty by Dr. Nassar and colleagues or whoever, or surgical revision of that area, and produce a fistula that's gonna work and not have juxtanastomotic problems, then that can be a fistula that lasts for many, many years. Um, the upper arms fistulas tend to be higher flow, more problems with aneurysms, more problems with outflow issues, and don't last as long. So it's the initial hump of maturation is the challenge for forearm fistulas. Particularly do you have, in do you have any predictors who, who does well versus the ones that don't do as well? Yep, so it turns out that it's anatomical primarily, right? There have been studies that have been done to say if you have coronary disease, if you have peripheral arterial disease, uh, non-anatomic things, if you're a woman over a man, if you're non-Caucasian, that your outcomes are worse. 
such that they would say, don't even do it. And Charmaine Locke is a real influential uh, Canadian nephrologist who's published a series on that and comes up with her score. But it completely ignores if they've got good vessels. So, I mean, realistically, it's best vessel size. I presume most nephrologists would agree. The size of the radial artery is extremely crucial for radiocephalic. Whereas in the upper arm, the size of the uh, cephalic vein is very crucial because the brachial artery, most of the time you can rely on it to provide you good flow. So the size and the health of the vessel, right? So people will do flow testing, they'll do um, you know, compression of the vessels and then see how much flow can, how much reactive hyperemia they can develop. Uh, the problem is that those are just a little more challenging to perform on a routine basis or not routinely done. But the size and the health of the vessel clearly are, are important. So if somebody has a house, heavily calcified vessel that can't grow and develop the additional flow required, then it's not going to work well. Because figure these fistulas have to, develop, have to develop enough flow that they can support good dialysis, right? So the normal flow to the arm is about 50 to 100 cc's a minute, almost nothing. When we put an access in the arm, we're shooting for an average flow of 800 to 1,000, right? So over an order of magnitude that the flow has to go up and still support the perfusion to the hand. Uh, so that's the challenge with more diseased vessels and elderly population is, you know, the balance of that, developing adequate access and not having steel. Because steel or ischemia to the hand is still a real problem. Uh, and that develops in, you know, 5 to 10 percent of people in most series that are done. Okay, well, very good. Thank you very much, Eric. Excellent presentation. Yeah, you should Back to day jobs. Look at, uh, yeah, but no, actually.